Hello, everyone. Welcome to Columbia Global Centers in Paris. My name is Lauren Wolf, and I am the senior program manager here. Uh, Reed Hall has belonged to Columbia for over 50 years and it is the longtime home, and it's mostly known up to this point as the home of the undergraduate program. In 2010, it was chosen to be one of the now nine Columbia Global Centers, along with Amman, Beijing, Istanbul, Mumbai, Nairobi, and we actually have the director of the Nairobi Center here tonight, <laughs> Murugi, Rio, uh, Santiago, and most recently, Tunis. We really like to think of ourselves as a third space between France and America, between the academy and the wider public, where we foster frank and rigorous interdisciplinary and intercultural dialogue. Tonight, we were so happy to capitalize on the presence of our Executive Vice President, Safwan Masri, to organize this event in celebration of Gilles Cabel's most recent book. Professor Cabel is a French political scientist and Arabist. He specializes in, in the contemporary Middle East and Muslims in the West. He's a professor at the Université Paris Sciences et Lettres, and is director of the Middle East and Mediterranean Chair at PSL, based at ENS. His most recent book, which just came out, is called Sortir du Chaos, Les Crises en Méditerranée et au Moyen-Orient. Uh, Gilles Capel will be in dialogue with Safwan Masri, whom, as I mentioned, is the Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University. He is also a senior researcher scholar at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. He is the director of the Columbia Global Center in Amman and has been since its founding in 2009. He most recently um, authored this book, which is called Tunisia and Arab Anomaly. And this was published by Columbia University Press in 2017. And we had a wonderful, um, a wonderful conversation with Safwan that you can actually watch on our website if you so feel like it, which I encourage you all to do. <laughs> um, the conversation tonight will be moderated by the award-winning author, Christopher Dickey, Paris-based world news editor for the Daily Beast. He, was previ he previously worked for, the, for Newsweek at the Paris Bureau um, as the Be Paris Bureau chief and the Middle East editor, and before that for the Washington Post at, at the Cairo Bureau. Um, his most recent work is entitled, Our Man in Chal Charleston, Britain's Secret Agent in the Civil War South. I wanted to say both of these books are on sale in the back uh, for after the conversation. And I thank you all for your presence and hope you enjoy the discussion. So now that now the really Hello, hello, ça marche? Okay, so that's always the first big test at one of these things, you know. Do the microphones work? And then sometimes they wire you up and you have to remember to take them off before you go to the men's room, but that's the, I'm glad that we've got these and they're working. Uh, I see people are still coming in, but I think we'll make do with that. I think it's nice to see such a great crowd here. I'm really glad that I didn't have to uh, tell you the titles of Safwan or of Gilles because they've both been, fr been friends of mine for so many years that I haven't kept track of those titles at all. Uh, but I have kept track of their work and they are really two of the most brilliant scholars of the Arab world that you could possibly see on a stage together or independently. Um, tonight what we're going to talk about, broadly construed, is how we went from 2010, 2011, and all the hope and the optimism and the possibilities that that moment called the Arab Spring at the time seemed to hold, how did we get from that to the Islamic State and all the terror and carnage of the Syrian war and the coup in Egypt and we can go down the list of all the terrible things that happened in the wake of the optimism of the Arab Spring, except in Tunisia, uh, which is, of course, the theme of Safwan's book, uh, Tunisia, an Arab Anomaly. But I'm going to ask each of them to sort of say what their books are about and what their perspective on that evolution is. And I think I'll start with Gilles, uh, because 
I hate you, Gilles. No, but because I want you, I want you to sort of lay out that basic uh, timeline uh, that you and I have talked about and that your book uh, deals with. Thank you. Ah. Miracle. Thank you so much, Chris. It's, uh, it's a treat to be here and uh, also to, to be here in a conversation with uh, Safwan under my beloved friend and his uncle Munim, who joined us specially from the skies on this occasion. And I would just say how moved I am to be here because uh, once upon a time, Columbia University dealt only with half of this building and the other half was uh, the International Relations Department of Sciences Po, where I spent 17 years. So at the time I was young, uh, more able than I am today, I saw better, I heard better, and uh, I just went up to my old office where I had been written about jihad for decades up there, and this was a place where people were dancing, and I suddenly thought that, you know, it showed that this was the paradise of Allah that had come finally to the place where I had toiled for so long. And uh, so thank you so much for, for having us here tonight. It's a, it's a treat and um, I'm very glad that there could be more uh, cooperation between uh, Columbia University, where I used to spend some time in the mid-1990s, uh, and, uh, and Ecole Normale Supérieure, where I'm now. Uh, to go back more precisely to uh, my very old friend Chris' uh, question, um, I would like to uh, just remind us very briefly that today is the 13th of November. Of course, you know that two days ago it was the 11th of November because uh, your president, I'm talking to Americans, and my president have exchanged the nom d'oiseau or the tweet d'oiseau in the meanwhile. <laughs> Uh, but um, uh, to us, of course, this is a very special date because uh, three years ago, the, the Bataclan uh, uh, assassinations and murders and attacks uh, took place. And this was the, the epitome, if you wish, or the apex of, uh, of the sort of jihad uh, system that had been put into place between the Levant, the Sham, and in Europe, uh, uh, France through Belgium, and something that had been unheard of. I mean, when uh, when uh, 19 uh, people in in four planes, um, in what was called at the time by the Islamist El Ghazwatayn and Mubarakatayn, the two blessed raids on New York and Washington uh, took place on the 11th of September 2011, 2001. Those people were, if I may say so, on the air, in the air. They were not grassroots. And this was a grassroots phenomenon. These were our kids who had gone there, who had gone to the Levant, who had come back and in order to butcher their co-citizens because they were uh, infidels, they were apostates, and what have you. So this was clearly something uh, extremely uh, uh, extremely harsh for our society. It's something that compelled us to look inside ourselves. And um, I believe that um, actually the uh, 13th of November um, uh, two, uh, 19, uh, 2015, in a way, is an answer to, uh, to the question that, that Chris uh, asked in the beginning. Uh, what we did not see uh, when we looked at the so-called Arab Springs, which actually did not happen in the spring, but during winter time, because uh, Bouazizi uh, set himself ablaze in December, which as far as I know is not spring, and uh, Mubarak uh, was ousted in February, uh, and uh, the, uh, the insurgency in Bahrain was put down on the 14th of March, which is seven days before the advent of spring of 2011, uh, was that, you know, we saw all those events in a, how should I say, a synchronistic fashion, as if, you know, it was useless to put them into the context of the history of the region. Uh, we looked at them as Revolutions 2.0. Uh, you know, it was like what had happened uh, in Berlin or Warsaw after the fall of the Berlin Wall or after 
the fall of the colonels or Franco in Greece and Spain. And, uh, uh, and this was something that we had been expecting for so long. Finally, the Arabs were becoming Democrats. Uh, and this was the end of this sort of dilemma between jihadism and authoritarianism. And they were like us. And, you know, we had no patience with Orientalists or Arabists go on into early retirement, go to the, the dustbin or whatever. What does that make this personal, huh? No, no. <laughs> this is this, absolutely. Well, this was what we were told at the time. Yeah. And wh what do you have to say? Nothing. You know, uh, and uh, actually what was not perceived at the time, that there were two, two things that were, shall I say, percolating. On the one hand, the synchronic phenomenon, which those guys in Tunis, in Cairo, in Damascus, Bahrain, wherever, of course, where uh, Twitter was already invented at the time, or the, uh, they were communicating worldwide, uh, and uh, they, they were open to what was happening on the rest of the planet. But simultaneously, there was a diachronic dimension. Right, and this was precisely uh, the time when what I had called <coughs> in previous books and also summed up in this one as what I call the third generation of jihadism had uh, sort of uh, taken uh, shape. From 2005 onwards, uh, a guy who had studied in France but was originally Syrian by the nickname of Abu Mus'ab al-Suri, and another one who was originally Jordanian, uh, Abu Mus'ab, the same uh, nickname, or Kunya Abu Mus'ab al-Zarqawi, who was operating in Iraq, had defined a new type of jihadism that considered the old jihadism or second gener generation jihadism of Al-Qaeda obsolete. They had targeted the faraway enemy. It was a sort of top-down jihadism. They had sent Saudis and some others in the sky. Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda. Al Al-Qaeda. Al Al yeah. No, no, no. The, 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 first, the, the, the previous generation. And, you know, it had been spectacular. Something that had to do with the good old days when people were watching TV, because 9-11 was something which was created for TV. And, um, but at the end of the day, they failed. They did not succeed in uh, sort of winning the insurgency in Iraq against the American invasion. And so they looked for a different model that uh, they called a sort of, in Arabic, Nizam la Tanzim, a system, not an organization. Something that was, that came, that was bottom up, came from the grassroots, that moved between Europe and North Africa and the Middle East, because uh, the faraway enemy, America, was too far away, actually. Whereas it was so easy to go from Paris to Algiers or, or, or Beirut or something, uh, uh, 50 euros, 100 euros for a ticket, if you got on a cheap flight. And this sort of thought of this phenomenon, of uh, how to, to, uh, to, to develop this new type of jihad, and they benefited tremendously it was a sort of an unexpected effect of the Arab upheavals, because the Arab upheavals led to the downfall of a number of, authorita of the authoritarian regimes. Let me take a brief example, and then I'll, 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 I'll stop, uh, which is also <coughs> very French. You may know that uh, France, which some say does not export many things, was the first export, net exporter of jihadists to the Middle East. We exported between 700 and 2,000. The first département that exported jihadists was Saint-Saint-Denis, north of Paris, which is a place which is, some say, predominantly Muslim now. The second one was the Alpes Maritime, the Nice area. People, when th people think of the French Riviera, they don't think of jihad export, right? Why was that? Because uh, the Nice area is mainly Tunisian in terms of its immigration, popula immigrant population, right? When Ben Ali was ousted in, <coughs> in January 2011, all the prisons were open. Political prisoners were freed, uh, criminals were freed, uh, Ikhwan were freed, and also jihadists. And those jihadists went to France, where they had their cousins, in order to organize their networks. And originally they wanted to go to Tunisia for jihad, but then 
they, for uh, uh, reasons that we may discuss later on, they decided to go to, to Sham, to, to, to the Levant. So this was um, something extremely interesting, you know, the sort of relation between, between the two phenomena. What happened in Europe and what happened in North Africa or, uh, or the Middle East. And to a large extent, uh, as, as we saw two days ago, we in Europe are part and parcel of this Middle East Mediterranean region, right? What happens there has immediate consequences on what happens here, not only because of jihad phenomena going to and fro. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was sentenced to death by jihadists and I was under police protection in this area where my family has lived for more than a century now, for a year and a half. What a strange thing. Uh, and uh, we also note that we're going to have elections next year, European elections. The extreme right has risen, uh, skyrocketed in, in, in Italy, because largely because of the, the tidal wave of immigrants, or the way it is perceived at part of the electorate. Same happened in Germany. So this is something that has uh, you know, effects and consequences on our um, on our political system, which is something very frightening. And uh, I believe that uh, among the sort of misunderstanding, to use a euphemism, that happened between, between uh, Macron and Trump, or between the Europeans and Americans two, day, two days ago, was this feeling that we were on different boats. And that our boat was rocking because of what was happening on the high seas of the Mediterranean. Uh -huh. well, thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. I, um, My pleasure. <clears throat> I, before I let you take it away, let me just sort of create a slightly broader construct. I mean, I think Gilles referred to this, but uh, when I was, I lived in Egypt for several years and then went back in 2011. And when I went back, I was struck by the fact that we had missed two rather important things in our observations uh, of, of Egypt and of the Arab world in general. One was a huge uh, explosion, demographic explosion of young people. There were huge numbers of young people. Median age often in Arab countries was 20. In some places it was 18. We knew that. And we knew that there were more modern communications than there had ever been before. When I lived in Egypt in the, early, in the 80s and the early 90s, it was almost impossible to get cable TV. Uh, by the time I was back in 2011, everybody had a cell phone. Everything was possible. You were communicating with everybody. Suddenly, and it wasn't just Twitter, it wasn't just social media, suddenly all these young people were in touch with each other and in touch with the world in a way they'd never been before. And they were educated and they didn't have any jobs. So you had an incredible explosive environment, which was exploited by exactly the people that Gilles is talking about. In Tunisia, all those things were true, as true as they were anywhere else. Now what I wonder is, what made Tunisia, as you put it, the Arab anomaly? the country that didn't slide into the clutches of ISIS or a military regime or some kind of Saudi-backed conspiracy. We'll get to that later. Uh, what was the difference in Tunisia? Was it personalities? Was it history? What was it? Uh, I do I have my own microphone? Well, maybe I still do. Anyway, you can take that one. May <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's right behind me. Thank yeah. you. Okay. That could be embarrassing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, does it turn on? Yeah, the famous thing. Push it up. There's a light. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, first of all, thank you to Brun, Lauren, and the magnificent staff of the Columbia Global Centers here in Paris for organizing this, and to Gilles' um, staff also for working with them. Uh, it's very special for me, professionally and personally, to be sharing the stage with uh, Chris and Gilles, uh, two great men for whom I have wonderful respect and as Chris said, uh, you know, we've friends, been friends for a very long time and it's great to have uh, wonderful friends also from New York and from all over the world here with us. So let me um, start, Chris, addressing your question by saying 
um, a couple of things before I delve into the um, Tunisian anomaly. Um, it started in Tunisia, December 17, 2010, Mohamed Bouazizi, a um, fruit vendor, street fruit vendor, sets himself up on fire um, out of desperation. Um, he makes a statement, of course, by uh, doing that, uh, the, uh, um, the, the set of events that takes place between December 17 and January 14, uh, fits with what Gilles um, points out to, and by the way, it's a wonderful book, Sortir de Cayo, and it uh, uh, really uh, chronicles developments in the region uh, that help explain where we are here today. I don't think it gives us a path out of the chaos, but uh, it gives us a way to understand the chaos that we are in today um, so that we can perhaps appreciate um, how we analyze the situation and how we think about the future of the region. Um, so you mentioned real uh, Karl Marx's uh, moment of enthusiasm as a precondition for success of a revolution. And in Tunisia, you had that moment of enthusiasm. It was a moment, I mean, not even a month. Um, the, there were similar events that were taking place elsewhere in the region. Egypt, I think, provides us with the greatest counter example, if you will, um, counter, but also with a lot of similarities with the Tunisian scenario. But there wasn't that moment of enthusiasm. It had actually taken uh, three years since the great uh, labor strike in Mahalla that took place in Egypt. It was uh, many months after uh, the torture of uh, a young man that went, that went viral. Uh, what happened in Tunisia, and we'll go back to explain sort of uh, the anomalous nature of it, but before we do that, I think we have been oversimplifying the situation. Um, Gilles, you uh, deconstructed or debunked the, the Arab Spring um, nomenclature that we've given it, uh, focusing on the spring, because it really wasn't spring. But it also wasn't Arab. It wasn't Arab, in the sense that these events were independent of one another to a large extent. You know, they, there was a domino effect in that something started in Tunis and then in Cairo and then in other capitals. True, there were similar uh, grievances, there were very similar conditions, what Chris, you pointed to in terms of the youth bulge, in terms of the um, ease of communication, um, you know, certainly in terms of the grievances that people had, the economic grievances, the grievances about authoritarianism. But otherwise, there were big differences in terms of the environments, the contexts, uh, to the extent that the histories were similar, they were also uh, quite different. And thus the potential uh, for a moment of enthusiasm to take root uh, was quite different from one place to another. Uh, there were more similarities perhaps across some countries that were geographically uh, grouped, such as Egypt, Libya, um, and Tunisia, than other countries in the Levant and Mesopotamia. Uh, but if you look across the entire, um, the entire region, I think the um, understandable thing was for Egyptians to feel inspired by their Tunisian brethren, to believe that it happened in Tunisia, it can happen in uh, Egypt, but that's where the parallel stops, because from that point onward, uh, what determined the success in Tunisia, the relative success in Tunisia, and the failure elsewhere, including in Egypt, were condi environmental conditions and contextual factors uh, that made the cases uh, quite different. Um, so what I argue in my book is that, and, and by the way, Chris, I mean, you know, the question that you asked is exactly what led me um, into this inquiry, because you know, I was living in the region at the time, I was in Jordan, and I was uh, following the events that were unfolding, and like many people, um, I felt, you know, what is happening in Tunisia? I mean, you know, first, you have the ouster of Ben Ali. You have more or less, for the most part, you know, 
peaceful protests. Uh, you have a peaceful transition into a constituent assembly uh, later in 2011. You have a Troika coalition of diverse political parties come together to share power in 2013 uh, when that becomes um, that that Troika um, is, is, is vulnerable to being broken down. Who but civil society comes in and saves the day? Um, and so the question, you know, what is so, these are factors, these are issues that are foreign in the rest of the world. Civic society is almost non-existent in the rest of the uh, Arab world. Uh, in places like Egypt, it is controlled by the government. In places like Jordan, um, it has royal patronage. In places like Palestine, with all due respect to my uncle here, um, it's been crushed by the Palestinian National Authority. There was a time when Palestinian civil society um, it was the oil that kept the machine going uh, after the first intifada. Now it's hardly existent. Um, so that was one factor that was very obvious to me that something that was worth investigating. And sure enough, uh, there's a history of civil society activism that goes back to the French colonial times um, that had nationalist legitimacy played a role in bringing about independence in 1956. Uh, its founder and its leader, Farhat Hashad, was assassinated by Le Mans Rouge, a terrorist organization um, connected to the uh, French uh, colons over there. So, uh, despite Ben Ali's attempts and Bourguiba's attempts before him to crush civil society, they couldn't. And the labor union that defined civil society became an inspiration for a lot of other uh, civil society types of organizations. So that's one. Hopefully we can get into the others later on. Uh, but I uncovered through my research to myself, because really I was trying to answer that question for myself, that there were conditions, there were factors, um, historical factors, that really were rooted in a modernization and the reform movement that had started um, as far back as the middle of the 19th century that created an environment in Tunisia that was quite different from the rest of the Arab world. So to go back to Egypt for a second, um, in Egypt you had civic society in the form of labor unionism that had started around the same time as it did in Tunisia, um, around 1919, 1920. But the um, regime of Jamal Abdel Nasser crushed it in 1957 and brought it under the control of the regime, such that the head of the Labor Union Federation was appointed by the president himself and also served at times as the Minister of Labor. So during the entire tenure of uh, Hosni Mubarak in 31 years, the labor union sided with the laborers on only one occasion. Um, by contrast, you had in, in Egypt a very strong hegemonic army, and that was an outgrowth uh, from uh, the, again, you know, the middle of the of the 19th century under Ottoman rule and continued to grow. And of course, the 1952 uh, coup was a military coup. It was the free officers coup. And every single leader of um, the Republic of Egypt, with the exception of Morsi, who ruled for a little bit over a, a year, was an army general. Uh, you had the opposite case in Tunisia. Uh, we had a very small army. And again, you know, that was from before the days of French colonialism. Uh, so my point is, and I'll give you, um, I'll give you back the floor, is that you know there were differences that uh, made Tunisia stand apart from the rest of the Arab world, and even though uh, youth in other capitals of the region thought that they could emulate the Tunisian experience, of course the outcomes um, have been um, quite different. It strikes me that one of the big problems uh, as we look across the region, but again, we keep coming back to Egypt, the most populous of the Arab countries, potentially the most politically powerful, maybe the best and worst example of what did and could happen. Uh, and what, what did happen there was you had this spontaneous uprising, and it was largely spontaneous. Would you agree with that, Shil? Originally, yes. And 
I remember talking to a lot of the young people who were involved with it, and I would say, so who, who really is the leader of this movement? Mm. And they didn't have a clue who the leader of the movement was. They talked about crowdsourcing the revolution. That's how techy some of these kids were. Well, that turned out to be a completely useless principle because what happened was the revolution, revolutionary movement was very quickly taken over by the oldest, most organized political movement in the Arab world, which was the Muslim Brotherhood. So would you see it more or less that way, Jean? Uh, more or less, for <laughs> rather more than less. Uh, but uh, I would like to go back very briefly to Safwan's um, uh, words and uh, about the sort of the, the Tunisian anomaly. Uh, well, you know, uh, one thing which was strange, maybe that was not on the anomaly side, we'll get to the anomaly a little later, was that the guy was not called Muhammad Bouazizi, he was called Tarek Bouazizi, which is, you know, Tarek is a name which with, doesn't have much of a religious connotation. But he was Mohammedized, if I may say so. Uh, he was Muhammad somewhere in his, uh, in his bigger name. But this was used in order to make him a key figure. So you could identify with someone who was called Muhammad better, right? And um, originally, uh, you know, he was a street vendor, Ba'i uh, Mutajawil, as they say in Arabic. And uh, the, the, the unions of the unemployed um, degree holders, les diplômés chômeurs, and I asked, how do you say that in colloquial Egyptian, this, in colloquial Tunisian, they say diplômé chômeurs. And uh, the, uh, don't try to say anything else, and uh, they, they, they made, they used him as, as, a, as a figurehead, if you, if they, it, it, they construed him, if I may say so, so that he would embody the sort of hogra, the, the, Le mépris, the, the contempt of the ruling class, right? And I, I remembered um, once, uh, you know, when I was a student at Sciences Po, I had a Tunisian friend who, who made a big career afterwards in Tunisia as an entrepreneur. And when I would go visit him, we would only, he would take me someplace on the seaside where we'd be only two of us, because when we were three in Tunisia at the time, Either one of us was a cop, or two of us were cops, or even the three of us were cops, right? So two was better. And he said, you know, Gilles, to be extorted by a cop, which was Ben Ali, is difficult enough. But being extorted by a hairdresser, which was his wife, is really too much. And to a large extent, you know, this middle class, or this entrepreneurial class, was fed up with the dictatorship that had become um, a sort of um, a predator on the very uh, social groups that it was supposed to defend. And the same was true for the Mubarak people, yeah. because in a way they were given a blank check by the West because they said, we're the bulwark against Al-Qaeda. Even Qazafi tried his hand at that and uh, you know, was received him in a princely manner by Sarkozy, who now has to deal with the um, judicial French authorities because of, only about fighting terror. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing, then to go on the anomaly, but you know, uh, Safwan, what was the first slogan of the Arab Revolution? The Arab Revolution. It was uh, degage, uh, degage, which is French, yeah, yeah. which is degage, get out, uh, spoken with a colloquial Tunisian. And when the when Al Jazeera broadcasted degage, degage for Egyptians, they just didn't understand because in Egyptian well, colloquial, in colloquial Egyptian, they say degag, degag means chicken, uh, so it doesn't mean anything. So they translated it into Arabic, and it means erhal. Now, um, uh, one thing about Egypt, very briefly, and uh, and then how we differentiate, because there is the Tunisian anomaly, and uh, I've, um, you know, I, I read uh, Safwan's book when, when it was out, and I was extremely interested with it, because it sort of tackled with questions I was asking myself, and, uh, and the book is, is quoted at length in, in my own book, so uh, you'll, have, you'll have all my enemies on top of yours, so which it may be a little, I'm sorry for that, Safwan. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I have no bodyguards anymore, don't mention that. And, um, but Chris can be a bodyguard. And, 
One, one, yeah, one, uh, this is why we put you in the middle. Um, uh, one story about Egypt, which more or less follows up, this is a more or less thing, uh, on what you said and slightly differs from it. Uh, in December 2011, I, with my late friend Gamal El Ritani, the famed Egyptian writer who was quite close to a number of military people, uh, we were invited to dinner at a general's place. He was the, the brains of the SCAF, of the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, and he had three doctorates. He told me, how many doctorates do you have? I said, I only have one. So he looked down on me. He had one from Bulgaria, one from Romania, and one from the Soviet Union. So, well, so we were, it was slightly unbalanced. And the, um, and you know, it was a sort of, uh, it was in the, the air defense thing, and there was a, a, a waiter, a metro D, that was dressed up, um, you know, in Far King Farouk style. They had not changed the, the clothes since then. And the gastronomy was King Farouk. So it was, you know, with the uh, shrimps, gambari floating in bechamel, in thick bechamel sauce. It was so obsolete. So, and maybe this is because of the, of the the aspect of the, of the waiter or the, the food or whatever, that I did not take seriously what the general told me. And because of the three doctorates, of course. He said, you know, we're going to let the, the brothers, the Muslim brothers, win. And so we're going to expose their stupidity and their uh, incongruity to the people. And they'll bring us back. Because they'll say, you know, that we are the best. So I did not say anything to him because I was his guest. And you know, in Egypt, you, it's not a good idea to say to a general he's stupid or he's obsolete. I mean, it's, uh, it's if you don't, if you're fishing for gambari or for trouble. And um, so, but I, and then I, I, when I wrote my diary, the Arab passion or the all those all those upheavals, I would not call them revolutions in retrospect. You know, the book was too long and I skipped that episode because I thought, you know, it was so irrelevant and it had nothing to do with it. And then this was the script of what happened. And so I confessed in this last book that even someone like me who thought I was the Orientalist and the guy who understood the old forces uh, had failed because we were suffused with, you know, with the, all those kids and revolutionaries. It was interdit, interdit, and so on and so forth. But you know, in Egypt, the army, played a very important role also. I, my gut feeling in retrospect is that they let the young people go to Tahrir Square. The police blocked the main streets, but the side streets were free. And they were not pleased with Mubarak. Uh, you know, Egypt is a Mamluk system where you have a, a, a syndicate of a senior a top brass who rules the country. and. When the top, the, the top guy dies, his children are either strangled or blinded, as they, they did in the good old days of the uh, Basileus in, uh, in uh, Constantinople. And, um, and he wanted to put Gamal on the throne. And they were not interested, his son. Or he wanted to go on. He was 82 already. So, you know, the, the, some sort of popular mischief was not bad. And then, you know, it, um, it went its own way. And then they had to adjust. But, I mean, uh, it's not that it was, the script was written from day one. I mean, they had to deal with it. But nevertheless, they were, they were now, on a, a wider base, and then I, I'll stop, the, I believe that, uh, Apart from the anomaly dimension and the fact that, you know, uh, Safwan did not mention that, that Tunisia, where I was uh, uh, last uh, summer, again, uh, you, you know, is the only Arab country where you have freedom of, of conscience. So you're free to believe or not to believe. Uh, there's uh, uh, inheritance is the same whether you're a man or a, a not yet, not yet, or is going not to be. Yet. And Sheikh Al Azhar already yeah. fulminate, fulminated yeah. uh, against that, and so on, so on, so forth. There are a lot of things about gay rights and whatever, but you'll you'll you know more about that. And um, so this is um, uh, this is something which is extremely interesting because it is not very likely that it will happen, as Safwan mentions in the rest of the, of the Arab world. It, it may, as of now, it may remain as it is. It may not, you know. Now, nevertheless, on top of that, and then you can go that on that, of course, uh, 
I believe the, the main uh, fault line is between the three countries on the African, northern African shore, uh, i.e. Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, which are fairly, by comparison, fairly homogenous, i.e. vastly Arab Sunni. There are Berbers in Tunisia and in uh, Libya, but they do not really count politically. And there are Ibadis, uh, most of them. Uh, they're from a different Islamic sect. There are Copts in Egypt, some 10% of the population, which is huge. But they do not, they have no real political power. And in those three countries, by different means, as the slogan had it, Shaab Yurid Iskat and Nizam, the people want the downfall of the regime. There was something that more or less looked like a people, right? What became of it is different, it's, it's another story. But they managed to oust the incumbent. On the other three countries where you had significant Arab upheavals, Bahrain, Yemen, and Syria, then you had very different types of societies. There were societies that were fragmented along denominational, sectarian, or ethnic lines. In Bahrain, you had Shia, a Shia majority and a Sunni minority, a uh, ruling minority. In Yemen, this was maybe the most interesting case, you had Zaydis, which are a sort of soft Shia sect, if I may say so, and Shafi'is, who are soft Sunnis. I say that because they used to pray in the same mosques. And then the, 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 the sort of uh, rupture between them was instrumentalized by uh, local forces and regional forces. And then you had Syria, where you had Christians, Muslims, uh, uh, Sunnis, Alawis, Druze, Kurds, Arabs, and the, the Levant, the Levant mosa mosaic that immediately precluded the creation of such a, a, such a thing as a Shab, as a people. Because uh, Bashar al-Assad would never let a, a Tahrir phenomenon, a Tahrir square phenomenon take place, you know? He was adamant that it could not happen. He used his weapons immediately and divided society along sectarian lines. Even though there were Christians, there were some Christians, some Alawis, who took sides against the dictator with the others. They were marginalized and it could never, uh, it could never merge, it could never melt into a revolutionary process. And I believe that this was this was the, the key difference between the Eastern and the Western revolutions. I mean, this was my, this is the hypothesis I would like to test. Yeah, so um, this brings up, I mean, a few things. Uh, one is, I'm not sure that I would characterize them as the Eastern and the Western. Uh, and I think, I mean, you also um, argued that there are, of course, differences, you know, within those. Uh, Libya, for example, uh, stands out in the North African context because uh, one, one can argue that it's the least homogeneous of the three countries. Um, you've got, you know, Tripolitania and Cyrenia and Fezzan in the middle, you know, three distinct provinces that only came together um, to oust the Italian colonizers um, to, to, to some extent. I mean, you've got tribalism um, is, is very much alive and, and Qaddafi used tribalism to create divisions within the country. Um, in Tunisia and in Egypt, up till the 20th century, uh, those are the only two countries actually, with the, to a lesser extent Morocco and Oman, who could claim that they had territorial legitimacy that goes back centuries. They had, um, you know, civilizations that had been, um, that had evolved in, in, in those two countries. You had a very distinctive uh, Tunisian identity and Egyptian identity um, going into the 20th century. And I argue that in Tunisia's case, because that persisted, and that was, um, a, that was cultivated and, and nurtured by Bourguiba, the first president after independence, uh, that had a big role in, 
um, in facilitating, if you will, a transition in Tunisia. In Egypt, of course, the Egyptian identity uh, gave way to a pan-Arab, pan-Islamist identity at the times of Jamal Abdel Nasser. Of course, the um, you know the, the Israel, uh, the Palestine question um, also played into that. But until the late 1940s, an Egyptian referred to an Arab as somebody from the Gulf states or a Bedouin in the Sinai. Um, I don't think that really ended, actually. It, never, it didn't <laughs> end, okay. And in Lebanon, as you and I know, it is still very much alive, uh, but, uh, you know, sort of as characterizing the, the country. So I agree with Gilles that the relative homogeneity, but in the case of Egypt and Tunisia, um, is a big distinguishing factor. Uh, the other thing that would make me think of Libya as a special case and maybe bring it closer to the uh, eastern frontiers is that um, in Yemen, in Bahrain, in Syria, and in Libya, you had foreign intervention. Okay. I was just going to get to that. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, in the case of Tunisia and Egypt, of course, there are all conspiracy theories. I mean, that's part of the breakfast that we have every morning in that part of the world um, is conspiracy theory. But, um, you know, as far as we can tell, uh, if there was any kind of foreign intervention, you know, it was far more subtle, um, if you will, um, in those two countries. But in the countries where you had the kind of, of, of volatile and violent outcomes, you had, as Gilles pointed out, the sectarianism, you had uh, the um, various sects uh, competing for influence, and you had foreign intervention. So why don't you get into that? Yes. Yeah, well, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I think that if the, one of the elephants in the room uh, is clearly the American invasion and occupation of Iraq. Uh, we, I think we often talk about this because it happened in 2003 as if somehow that had no impact uh, on, on all of these developments when in fact it had a huge impact in countless different ways, especially if we're talking about the so-called Islamic State. The other area of foreign intervention that I think is worth mentioning is um, Saudi intervention and Qatari intervention, uh, particularly in Syria, but not only in Syria. In fact, Egypt would be a very conspicuous case because Qatar supported the Muslim Brotherhood when it was running Egypt, and, it's, and Saudi uh, supported the army when it took over. Right. In fact, people forget that uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi one of his earlier postings was as this, the Egyptian military attaché in Riyadh. So his relationship with Saudi went way back. And that competition between Saudi and Qatar, or really it's more between Saudi and the Brotherhood, I think you can trace all through uh, the Arab world after 2011 uh, in a major way. Um, and I just would look for your insights in that vis-a-vis -vis sure. Tunisia, but also in the whole region. Right. So, I mean, let's, let's start with Tunisia. I think one of the things that sa saved Tunisia and helped Tunisia historically is the fact that it didn't really feature into the, um, or on the radar um, of the rest of the region, right? You know, it wasn't important enough. A small country, small population, uh, you know, off sort of away um, on the Mediterranean, closer to Europe geographically. Uh, its foreign policy also was non-interventionist, um, and this is one of the reasons why Bourguiba was able to maintain a small army. So all of these things, and it was, you know, no oil uh, to speak of. Um, and it wasn't home to the Muslim Brotherhood, <laughs> the way that uh, Egypt um, was, you know, where Muslim Brotherhood was born in the late 1920s, and Nahda, the politically Islamist party in Tunisia, which now claims not to be uh, an Islamist party, was born in 1981. Um, so, you know, a, a huge difference there. But the irony is that Tunisia was unimportant to the rest of the region, and to the world for that matter, uh, and that's something that worked to its advantage. But now that it has been transitioning somewhat successfully towards democracy, it is important to the region. You know, now Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, pay attention to Tunisia. They pay attention to Tunisia exactly for the reasons that you just pointed to, Chris. So 
in Nahda when it was part of the Troika, when it held the government between 2011 and 2013, Qatar was supporting it. Qatar was putting a lot of money into Tunisia. When the Troika fell and a year later, Nida Tunis, a secular party, comes into power, the United Arab Emirates, acting on its behalf and on behalf of Saudi Arabia, starts funding Nida Tunis indirectly by injecting money into the country. The moment Nida Tunis forms a coalition with a Nahda, <laughs> Uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, get very upset and they start withdrawing their investments. Now there's a breakup, there's a divorce between those two parties. Um, so so we, we, will, we will see what happens. Um, but I think the hatred, and, and you've written uh, brilliantly about this, Chris, the hatred that Saudi Arabia has always harbored towards the Muslim Brotherhood um, certainly you know, played into uh, how it dealt with things in Egypt, it's played into how it has played with things in, uh, in Syria. You know, beyond the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the competition for a hegemonic role in the region, the alliance between uh, Qatar and Turkey, both supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, is again you know, part of the schism that we have seen between Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Egypt on the CC on the one hand and Turkey and Qatar on the other, a situation that has of course been um, even intensified uh, because of the uh, of the Khajukhri um, affair. Uh, Gilles also tracks, um, you know, very um, uh, fluidly and 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 uh, uh, accurately. I think the uh, various roles that these countries played in supporting different. Uh, rebel groups, uh, so to speak, in Syria um, at different times. Um, so I think the role that Saudi Arabia in particular, uh, but I would say the Gulf in general, meaning the three uh, large Gulf uh, countries of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Qatar, um, have played in the region, have played in bringing about the uh, outcomes that we see in the uh, um, in the Arab Spring countries has been an incredibly sinister role. And let me just finish by saying, I mean, Libya is a prime example of that. So you have a government of Faiz Sarraj in Tripoli that's recognized by the United Nations, that's backed by Turkey and Qatar, and you have Khalifa Haftar in Benghazi who is supported by uh, um, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And we... Um, and sorry, and France, and France, and Italy, of course, is supporting uh, the others because of its own interests in Metropolitana, right? You know, the flow, the flow of oil in one, and, and, and the flow of migrants that it wants to, um, um, to control. Um, so, um, you know, Saudi Arabia is, is maybe has played the, the uh, continues to play the because what, what will be interesting, Chris, and this is more back of a question to you and to Gilles by me, if I may, is what do we, uh, to all of us, is what do we expect in terms of the Saudi role given recent developments? Do we believe that um, Saudi Arabia has been weakened by the Khashoggi affair? Uh, whatever happens or doesn't happen with MBS. Gilles? Well, before, before I answer, I try to answer and this question, or rather put the Khashoggi affair into perspective, which is probably the, the most important thing we can do as far as we do not know exactly how this thing was decided. And, you know, it looks so strange, but, you know, but in terms of the perspective, there's a lot to say. Uh, just an anecdote about the role of the, uh, of the Qataris uh, in Tunisia. In 2012, when it was the heyday of Muslim Brother influence. And Qatar was funding everybody. And Turkey was proud of everything. Davut Oglu was still around. And Al Jazeera was everywhere. And Al Obama was also uh, pushing the brothers uh, way in, way out. Because America, at the time under Obama's president, he saw the brothers as, you know, the natural outcome of those re re upheavals and the way some order could be put in it. You know, some, uh, they were 
perceived as sort of Muslim Democrats, or as a sort of a variation uh, with beers on Christian Democrats at the time, which was one of the many illusions uh, without a future, as this, as Freud would have said. And uh, the um, so I was waiting for an interview with Ranushi in Tunis. He was late because he was in Qatar. And as they said jokingly at the time in Tunisia, he was refueling. Can ye fawil? So he was putting some benzene into the, uh, some cash into the coffers. But at the time, you know, it was before uh, the, the Emir of Qatar would uh, abdicate and uh, give power to his son. And so no one knew exactly whether it would be Tamim, his son, who would seize power, or uh, Hamid bin Jassim who was the prime minister and the most powerful man. So Tamim had his own institute uh, with the Palestinian guy, um, Azmi Az Az Bishara, and uh, Hamid bin Jassim had the Al Jazeera Institute. So at the time, uh, Hanushi was with, uh, with the Azmi Bishara group. So he came back to Tunisia, and this was a terrible time because this was when the American ambassador was killed in, the, in, in Benghazi in the consulate. And uh, this was the time also when Renouchi uh, started to, to, to be panicked at the idea that uh, he might pay for the fact that he could not check the violence of the extremists. And, uh, and then later I, would, I was going to Qatar and whom do I, did I meet there? at a conference organized by Al Jazeera Institute for the promotion of Muslim brothers worldwide under the aegis of uh, Hamid bin Jassim, Ranushi and all the brothers because they didn't, didn't quite know who was going to win and they thought that, you know, they could get extra benzene and, uh, on, on both sides. It was very funny because they were all going to, you know, to... And uh, so this was definitely uh, extremely interesting to see how, what, how the interference of all those, uh, those people were coming. You know, this traces back to where I, I, I sort of put the beginning of the, of the time period for, for this, uh, this era, which is, uh, I go back in the, in the book, the inception to the, which is the, the October or Kippur or Ramadan War of 1973, October 1973, where the skyrocketing of the oil prices go in par with the Islamization of politics, and where the petro monarchies have their, had their say, they sort of marginalize the nationalist countries, and they will marginalize little by little the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And it's not only, as you said, it's part and parcel of it, the Muslim brothers versus the Salafi or the Saudi, or because the Saudi coalition has become very, how do you say, plastic, we say in French, uh, because it includes Salafis, but now it also includes Israel. Uh, and uh, it's also, the, goes back to the roots of the Sunni Shia dispute which I believe is uh, one of the major fault lines. And in the, today, in, in, in the book, in uh, Sortir du Chaos, we have a, a beautiful mass, but this, it's, they're not mine, so I can praise them, by a, a French cartographer and, and uh, geographe called Fabrice Ballanche, who knows the, reg sorry, the Levant and the region very well. The first map uh, is uh, the Middle East Mediterranean region in 1973 with the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict in the middle, the East-West divide, Iran and Turkey backing uh, uh, Israel, um, uh, the you know, pro-Soviet uh, uh, battle, uh, battle front uh, states, and uh, Saudi Arabia and the others were more pro-American, who do not like them, and so on. Then we have a totally different map at the end of the book, uh, which is the present day map, where the Sunni-Shia conflict, in my view, is the main fault line, when the fractures within the Sunni bloc that you just mentioned, between the brothers Turkey and Qatar on the one hand, and the Saudi and their friends, the Saudi bloc, as they say, on the other is our prevalent, and with Russia coming back, and the, uh, the Israeli-Arab uh, or the Israel-Palestinian issue, but I'm sure, sure Munib will say something about that later, uh, which is to some extent marginalized. 
which is still there as a very strong irritant, but which is not key to uh, the fate of the region as it is perceived now. And to take only an example, when on the uh, 14th of, uh, of May, uh, America moved its embassy to Jerusalem, 60 Palestinians from Gaza were killed by Israeli snipers on the border. There was very, very little reaction in the Arab world. Everybody was, so many people, more, many more people were killed in Yemen or were killed in Syria or in Libya that same day. This is not to say that it is not going to come back, but you know, the Palestinian question, of course, has been fractured between Hamas and PLO and so on and so forth. And, and the Israelis are now allied with the Russians. And they also aligned with the Saudis. So, and we'll, we'll deal with Syria later and with uh, Putin as, as, as the key man and also as a giant with the feet of clay. But to go back to what you, what you said, I believe that this is something that also has to do with, you know, we forgot the diachronic dimension, as I mentioned earlier on. You know, 73 is the moment where you have the, 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 the building of the Islamic space of meaning, meaning space, or whatever we say in English, espace de sens, we say in frog speech. And then 79, you know, there's a fragmentation. I mean, uh, the, the, the Islamic revolution uh, comes out, and then you have Khomeini with Shiism and a revolutionary understanding of Islam as opposed to a conservative and pro-Western understanding of Islam that, that are pitted against each other. Then you have the jihad in Afghanistan, which is killing two birds with one stone, darb asfarain bi hajar wahid. The first asfur, the first bird, is the Soviet Union, of course, but the other one is Shia, Iran. And the 15th of uh, February, 1981, when you have the Soviet pullout, from Afghanistan, which will lead to the Berlin Wall issue on the 9th of November, is, and I believe most of us here are old enough, unfortunately, to have already been active at the time, I guess that most of us do not remember what happened on the 15th of February. And I, when I say that to my students, who usually were not born at the time, they don't know, they look at their shoes, and I said, you know, you don't know because you all know what happened the day before. So they're, they're in panic, they try to avoid eye contact for fear they get a bad grade. And suddenly someone, and, now, and we're on American territory, so I have to be very careful about me too, and I know you're watching. So use, in the old days, I say a young woman, I say a young woman or a young man also, no, blushes and says, sir, it was Valentine's Day. And I said, yes, it was Valentine's Day, but this was not the, wrong, the right answer. It was the fatwa day. It was Khomeini's fatwa against Salman Rushdie. And you know, he just pulled the carpet under the feet of the Saudi. He's, he stole the show. Everybody was fascinated with this issue. And it's sort of, uh, uh, we did not focus on what was important, which was the main geopolitical change that the Red Army was defeated, which would lead to the end of the Soviet bloc. And then, you know, so ben, ben, um, ben Laden and Zawahiri learned their lessons. In Zawa one of Zawahiri's, uh, his main manifesto, which, is pro which was probably published 2006-7 online, called Fursan Taht Rayyat al-Nabi, Knights with a K under the Prophet's banner, uh, he said, you know, we lost the media war. I mean, the Iranians managed to, to win the media war. And when they implemented 9-11, this was something that, you know, it was a battle that they, they had, that they fought on the media war. And then you had this to and fro thing with the Sunnis and the Shias taking advantage of each other until finally the Arab Springs, or the Arab whatever you call them, upheavals, in the sort of their, what I when I mentioned their Western dimension, and I uh, I do not disregard, of course, what Safwan said that you know, Libya was more comparable in a way uh, with what happened in the uh, Eastern uh, countries because there was foreign invasion, because there was this tribal fragmentation. I agree with you, but uh, it had nothing to do with the Sunni Shia divide, no. right? Whereas on the eastern part, it was taken hostage by the Sunni Shia divide, whether it be Bahrain, where there was some real ground for it, Yemen, where it was cooked, 
and Syria, where it was uh, a, a sort of, uh, how to say, boiled up or whatever. And this is, this is a story that unfolds, that has been unfolding, unfolding since 1973, since we had this Islamic space of meaning, and even more so since 1979, when you had the uh, fight for hegemony over the meaning of Islam. On the, with the Saudis on the one hand and the Iranians on the other. Now, to go back to your question, Chris, Chris sorry, what does the Khashoggi affair change with this issue? Because we had Mohammed bin Salman who said to whoever would listen that these things were going to be different, that, you know, this ulama issue was not that important, and that if the ulama did not abide by what the Wadi al Amr, the, the rulers, said, they would just. Uh, go to jail and he was going to have no patience with them uh, and you know I've been going to Saudi Arabia quite a few times over the last years I was uh, forbidden to enter the country for seven years between 2010 2017 and so you know I could I had been there a lot before as you remember before 2010 and I could see the difference you know, after seven years, where you had boys and girls together, if I may say so. And, uh, and people, not in public, but many of them are young people saying that they were atheists. More maybe than in Egypt and easily, uh, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, many things changing and the new generation deciding that, and, and MBS surfing on that wave, if I may say so, more than uh, than engineering it in a way. Now, we had the Khashoggi affair. Khashoggi was someone that many of us knew. Chris, you knew him, of course, also. And I don't know whether Safwan, you had met him also. Yeah. So we all met him. Everybody had met him. Even three of us had met him. Everybody had met him. And um, he was uh, someone who was raised up as a Muslim brother. Uh, he socialized with Ben Laden when he was a freedom fighter, to quote uh, your president, Ronald Reagan, late president. Uh, then he was, I, I met him, and I think you met him also, with someone whom you introduced to me, uh, Prince Turkil Faisal. So I owe you many things, among, among others, that introduction, which opened Saudi Arabia to French scholarship. So you, maybe we, 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 we will give you a statue. There's a true Chris Dickey. Who oh, that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and uh, when Prince Turkey was not more Minister of Interior, but you know, who, who wanted to open the country. And definitely, uh, Jamal was around, and uh, he was... Uh, he was talking to everybody, spoke good English, gave access, and uh, then what happened was that uh, I believe that, you know, even though he shared many of the global views of MBS, nevertheless, he was hostile to this authoritarian way of ruling the country. He was close to a number of people who were jailed uh, during the so-called Ritz, Ritz Carlton Revolution. This is an oxymoron, of course. And uh, then decided to go in exile in America, where he sided, and this, you know, this part of the story thought better than I do, with the anti-Trump uh, press. Uh, be uh, an editorialist in the Washington Post and so on and so forth, and then got much closer to the Ikhwan of his youth. I was in Turkey in, uh, in, in September this year, and he was there. I did not see him, but a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, was uh, take, took part as uh, an observateur in a, in a conference organized by the brothers under the, the aegis of Wada Khanfar, the former uh, uh, editor-in-chief of Al Jazeera, on the future of the Brotherhood. And he was part and parcel of the, of the show, you know. So, re a residence between uh, the Washington Post and Turkey, Brotherhood issues, an insider in the system who right. knew so many things about the system, so this was a sure recipe for problems. Now, why would he go into Qu'est-il allé faire dans cette galère, as we say in French? Why would he go uh, to the Saudi consulates? I don't have a clue. I mean, I've heard a number of stories. I've not been convinced by any. Uh, but this is clearly now weakening 
to answer finally your question. You know, the French like to meander. We're going to do. Way. We're going to do sound bites from now on. <laughs> okay, very good. I know. I know your patience. Good luck. <laughs> sabr, sabr jamil, as they say in Arabic. Patience is beautiful. But um, uh, it definitely the the what I think is more the, the thing to be admired most in this story is the, the quality of Turkish intelligence. <laughs> you right. know, they could, uh, how do you say, they could make en un coin, um, put an, an edge or something, um, um, a wedge. Yeah. A wedge, yeah, I was looking for a wedge. In between Saudi Arabia and America, huh. using uh, domestic contradictions in the States. I mean, playing on the, you know, the liberal press, the Washington Post against Trump just before the midterm elections when Saudi Arabia is not really the favorite even of the conservative electorate, right? So this is, I mean, temporarily, I believe Saudi Arabia is weakened. Erdogan took the better part of it because he used it for his own interest to put pressure on the Russians so that he is the master of Idlib and he, uh, he has managed to uh, keep the Russians from bombing Idlib and his own guys there, his own rebels are protected for the time being. Will it last? This weakening of Saudi Arabia, the country is extremely resilient. Uh, it's after the midterm elections have passed now. I do not see the Trump administration as exerting an enormous amount of pressure on him. To what extent will he stay or not, inherit his, uh, or became, become king? Maybe not immediately, but if my understanding of the so-called Ritz-Carlton revolution is right, uh, I do not feel that there are many significant competitors in the room for the time being. So, I don't know. This is more gut feeling and uh, uh, crystal than, uh, you know, so you know better. We've, we've been going on for a little bit over an hour now. Uh, so I'd like to open the floor up to questions and comments, which um, should be a little bit briefer than our own uh, discourse up here. This is another oxymoron, right? <laughs> or an understatement. Right? And, uh, well, let, let me respond to a couple of No, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Of course. Um, because I'm also eager to get questions from, uh, from the audience. Um, I think a couple of things are worth uh, just you know, going back to for a second. The fascinating thing about the Khajurji affair is that it has brought into our consciousness um, things that we had swept under the rug or did not pay attention to um, and are now finally paying attention to. Um, I think the grotesque way by which it happened, the way that the Turks masterfully managed the uh, media in the process and leaking information, the fact that he's one of ours, I mean, he lived in Virginia, he wrote for the Washington Post, um, has really brought it to the fore. But the truth of the matter is, there were, between January and April of this year, 48 beheadings at the hands of the states in Saudi Arabia. 600 executions over the past four years since MBS uh, started rising to power. Um, I don't think, I mean, the Yemen war, the tens of thousands killed, uh, the famine that is taking place there, um, I think, you know, and, and the world was starting to pay attention, and as we know, there was a bill that was defeated in Congress in June that would have put limits on the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia to be used in Yemen. That was defeated narrowly, 55 to 44. It was championed by uh, Bernie Sanders, who, and it's going to be uh, brought back to the Congress, and uh, chances are, I mean, Chris, you, you would know more about the politics of the Beltway. Um, I think that Saudi Arabia um, is weakened not only for the short term and not only vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but also regionally. And I think you've painted that, analyzed that very, very well, uh, Gilles, in terms of how Saudi Arabia's hand is weakened. Um, uh, certainly, Turkey's hand is much stronger. Uh, Iran's hand is far stronger. So, depending on what happens vis-a-vis -vis Iran with its stronger hand as a result of the weakening of Saudi Arabia over the weeks and months to come, will determine 
um, whether Saudi Arabia um, gains some strength or continues to be in a weak position. As far as MBS is concerned, um, I don't see him going away anytime soon. Um, and I don't think that there are any competitors. Um, most of those competitors have been uh, neutered, and uh, you know, vis-a-vis that it's Carlton and and other means, everybody is um, is is too scared to have a face-off with him. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens after King Salman dies, and whether uh, members of the House of Saud who have been able to um, get the ear of the king, who has reined him in on a couple of occasions. Uh, one very, very significant, of course, has been reining him in vis-a-vis -vis the ultimate deal and his talks with Jared Kushner um, and uh, the whole thing uh, you know, with, with Israel. Um, once King Salman is gone, you know, what happens in terms of the power dynamic within the House of Saud will be uh, does he get taken out? Who knows? I mean, I, we used to always look in the Middle East for analogies, ways to describe the complications of the Middle East, and we used to say three-dimensional chess, and I remember for a while, once I was lucky enough to have uh, dinner in the private quarters of King Hussein, and I noticed he had this big TV with all these cassette tapes in front of it, and front and center, the most uh, worn box of tape was uh, The Godfather. <laughs> Clearly, it was watched many times uh, in, the, in the private quarters of the palace. Now, it's clear that the best analogy is Game of Thrones, uh, including, as we've seen, murders. Right. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll probably see more of that. But I, as I said, I wanted to open this up uh, two questions. And I think, if I may, Muneeb, I think you, you had something you wanted to say? Good evening. Um, I was debating tonight to come or not to come. I'm, I'm very ill, but I'm glad I came. I'm glad. It is pushed. It is green. It's just yeah, Munib. Munib just speaks very softly. It's green. I think it's from there. Good evening for everybody. Um, I'm a believer in something called meant to be. I have my vibes tonight telling me, even if you're sick, but go. I know two gentlemen here, one of my cousin and one of them is acquaintance. You can't hear me. Do you want to try this one? Maybe this one will work better. Is acquaintance of mine. Uh -huh. One of them is my cousin Safwan, and the other guy is Gilles Gapel. And I have a lot of respect for a man. Even if I don't see him, I often think of him. Christopher. <laughs> I don't see you, but I often I think of you. I'm different. I'm 85 years old. I go to bed at 12 o'clock and I wake up at 2 o'clock. 18 hours or 20 hours of thinking, thinking of something called Palestine. I'm obsessed since I was 8 years old about something called Palestine. Tonight is a special place for me, Colombia, Paris, I came to share with the French uh, about their protocol, they call the Paris Economic Protocol for the Oslo thing, which is dying or which is going, but they have obligation to see that we're going to implement it. It's too many things in my mind, it's hajj-bajj, but right place, Columbia University, right three people, I'm going to share something with them because I think they mentioned vocabularies, but they are not connected. Conspiracy, a plan, Israel. Tonight I have something to share with you, the three of you. And I hope we can come up with something, because uh, in my mind, there is a plan, a conspiracy, the, the deal of the century, and it's in the making, and the Arab Spring is part of it, I believe. So I, I, don't, I don't want to take much of your time, but I will 
have the privilege of talking to you because if there is something to be done, the three of you can put it in. That a plan which is started the 18th century and we see that it's, it's coming to a something called the Jewish State of Israel plan. And with a think tank, and they've taken us around and around and around, but the end result is going to be the great Israel from the Nile to the Euphrates, uh, implemented by the century, the plan of the century. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, myself, yes, okay. I think, but I think that it, I think it's also an important reminder that if we'd been speaking ten or fifteen or twenty years ago, certainly if we'd been speaking before 9/11, this com conversation would have been dominated by the would have been dominated by the question yeah. of Palestine yeah. and Israel, yeah. and we've talked most of this evening without even mentioning Palestine and Israel. It, it's stunning. And we, maybe not tonight, but one thing would be interesting that would be interesting is to see how that center of gravity was taken away from the Palestinian issue right. and then distributed elsewhere. So I'll, I'll take a quick uh, crack at that, if I may. I mean, the, uh, and I wanted to say this earlier, but, but for time's sake, I did not bring it up. When uh, Gilles was talking about the, uh, you brought up the conflict. What was interesting is that during the upheavals, during the protests of 2011, um, Palestine did not feature into those protests. I failed to see um, during the protests or after the protests any graffiti or flags or signs in Tahrir Square um, that paid homage to Palestine, right? Uh, and that was true in Tunis and that was true everywhere. Now, what does that tell you? I mean, I think that there is the, the, the issues at hand, what brought people to the streets uh, were very local elements. And that takes us back to my argument that there was very little that was Arab about the Arab Spring. You know, there was very little that was Islamist even about the Arab Spring. There was very little that was common, okay? I mean, some of the conditions were common, but the, uh, everything was local. It was localized, you know, it was about daily bread. It was about, um, you know, Tariq, Muhammad, Abu Azizi being slapped by a policewoman and humiliated. It was about Karama, right? Uh, but there's also, I think, a sense of fatigue um, in, in, in the region. Uh, the, there's also, if you notice, that our vocabulary has changed over the past few years. We don't talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict anymore, <laughs> right? It's the, I mean, we shouldn't talk about the conflict because the conflict takes place between two equal parties. It does not take place between an occupier and an occupied. But if we accept, for the sake of argument, the term conflict, it's a Palestinian-Israeli conflict, right? So I think you're, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. The ultimate deal, I am I'm less concerned about that today than I was even six or nine months ago. I think that MBS has been reined in. Uh, even CC has recognized that this is something that would be too costly. I think King Abdullah has been effective to the extent that he was brought into this very late in the game. I worry about Jordan um, quite a bit in terms of what, what happens. But I think also Israel is not in any rush. I mean, currently the status quo for Israel is not, is not costly. Uh, well, right. pa patience but is always a part of the Middle East, I think. Could I, could I sort of uh, follow up briefly on uh, Munib's remarks. Uh, actually, you know, on the first map, the central caption in the map is Arab-Israeli conflict. In the map of 73, on purpose, I called it the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in 2018, because it has changed dimension because of the Sunni-Shia rift and because of the intra-Sunni dispute and so on. And because, you know, and in the book I try to, to uh, make sense of how it became like that. Like, for instance, the Afghan Jihad was a very important issue. And there are some Palestinians at the time who said, had the Saudis paid one-tenth 
of what they paid to support the Afghan Jihad to the Palestinians, things may have changed, right? And uh, you know, yeah, 9-11 was also something strange because in a way, 9-11 hijacked the Palestinian conflict. I mean, it used its modus operandi. The suicide attacks were something that were implemented by Hamas after they came from Hezbollah, after they had come from Iran, and so on and so forth. And Ben Laden stole, if you wish, this mode of action and uh, sort of brought it to, uh, to New York and Washington. And in a way, it emptied the, uh, the Palestinian struggle from its weapon of choice at the time and trivialized it for a different issue, which was the all-out jihad. Remember at the time, you know, there were uh, fatwas by a number of people, including Karadawi, who said that it was, it was legal to commit, to sacrifice himself against, uh, against the, the Israelis. And then suddenly, what, did he have to, what could he say about America? So he stepped back because the brothers had to keep their friendship with some people in America. And, and so, you know, it, it's a very interesting thing. And I, I paid a lot of attention to it in the book to see how, how it moved from, from uh, one, uh, one issue to the, to the other. One thing I would like to add to what Safwan said also about whether it was Arab or not, and is that the Arab upheavals definitely fragmented the Arab world, Sunni, Shia, uh, Saudi, Ikhwan, or whatever, and also... Al-Mu'amara <laughs> al-Kibira. And then the, uh, also now you have a very significant rise of dialects. Uh, like, for instance, we, we live now in the digital era. It's not Al Jazeera anymore. It's not uh, people do not watch television. Uh, the other day I asked my students, first year students, how many of you watch TV to be informed? There were a crowd of 150. How many hands raised were, did you raise out of 150? How many watch TV, do you think? Zero. Three. Yeah. yeah. Which is extremely impressive, right? And uh, so. The, uh, so now it's the it's websites and whatever, the digital era. And this, this goes in dialect to a large extent. Far less, you know, Al Jazeera <laughs> was maybe the last, uh, the, the Swam's song of Arabism, even though it was Gulficized. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. I mean, you know, I'm used to Gilles being controversial. He hasn't said anything controversial tonight. So I'm going to say something controversial very quickly, Chris. And that is, I think the fact that the Arab part of it has been dropped from the lexicon is a good thing for the Palestinian cause. And I'll tell you why. I think by regionalizing the Palestinian struggle and by Islamizing the Palestinian struggle, something that Israel was very happy to contribute to, um, it made it a regional religious struggle when it is a humanist struggle. I mean, and I think the fact that there is a shift today in the world opinion regarding Palestine, Israel. We see it. I see it in New York. I mean, I see it uh, happening at a very, very, very fast pace. And it's no longer generational. You know, a few years ago, it was, wow, students. I mean, you know, if you told me 20, 25 years ago that I would see student activism uh, carried on by Jewish students on college campuses the way that I see it today, I would have told you, I would have thought you were out of your mind. It's no longer generational, though. It's no longer, I mean, you know, when Ronald Loder uh, disavows himself from the policies of Israel, uh, and when people like him do that, something is shifting, something is happening. And I do think that the Palestinian struggle uh, needs to be defined uh, increasingly uh, as a human struggle, as a struggle for human rights. And so I think it has been ill-served <laughs> by the Arab and Muslim, not even Islamist um, context that it had. I think it actually has always been instrumentalized. I, years ago, I was in Amman interviewing Abu Jihad, uh, and uh, I was with an editor of the Washington Post who said to Abu Jihad, what did you ever do for the Palestinians? 
And he went on for about five minutes saying, you don't know what it was like to have the, the boot of the Gulf Arabs on your neck. You don't know what it was like under the Egyptian Muhabarat. You don't know what it was like under this. He never once mentioned Israel. It was all about taking the Palestinian issue back from the Arabs right. and making it a Palestinian fight led by Palestinians. And probably it will be better again if, uh, if, the, if we see that again, although maybe not with the same strategy and tactics that Abu Jihad employed. Um, Greg. Now, I, there's two countries we've not mentioned much, which are Morocco and Algeria, because they didn't really have any sort of uprisings. Is there any chance that they could follow Tunisia and become real democracies at some point through a softer route, or do you not have much hope? Uh, I'll, I'll maybe I'll leave Algeria to um, to Shiel. I'll say a couple of things quickly about Morocco and and to some extent Algeria. Um, so you know, I think to me, I mean, in my book, I argue that the history of reformism and modernization that took place in Tunisia is what explains what happens today. Uh, that the um, uh, that that moderation took place in the sphere of social reform, starting with the abolishment of slavery in 1846, two years before France did, uh, the first constitution, 1861, you know, of any Arab or Muslim country, secular education, the rights of women uh, were argued for in the 1880s and 1890s, and sure, they were also by uh, Egyptian intellectuals, but uh, m much of what happened to, to, to put those things, uh, to push those things forward, happened within the religious establishment, the Zaytuna Mosque. Now, the, um, so, so all of those factors, I think, you know, come together and produce a Tunisian, I don't want to use the word exceptionalism, um, but a, the special case of Tunisia uh, that doesn't exist elsewhere. Now, in Algeria, very quickly, I mean, you had a very different set of factors. You had independence take place in 1962 after at least a million were dead. Um, you had an anti-colonial visceral reaction in Algeria that's totally understandable, right? Um, that uh, abolished everything that was French, um, that uh, brought in religion into the curricula. Uh, you know, it was a very Muslim, if you will, Arab uh, anti-colonial reaction. And then Gilles maybe can take it from there and talk about developments from, from that point onwards. In Tunisia, what you had was a continuation of a tradition that had started about 100 years before independence. Because in Bourguiba, you had a Western-minded individual who uh, even during the colonial times, he and his compatriots did not reject everything that was colonial. They did not reject everything that was colonial. So for example, they modeled their education system on the French education system. They themselves were products of the French colonial system. Bourguiba studied at the Sorbonne, okay? His first wife was French, <laughs> okay? Um, and he insisted, for example, I'll just give you once more, on bilingualism in the education system. He insisted on the retention of French teachers while Tunisian teachers were trained to teach Tunisians. During the 1970, uh, 1961 uh, Bizerte crisis between De Gaulle and Bourguiba, in the resolution of that crisis, the one thing Bourguiba insisted on was that French teachers would continue uh, to stay in Tunisia. So you had a very different history leading to independence and a very different reaction to colonialism, very understandable. Morocco, uh, I think the... Um, uh, again, you know, it doesn't share the same kind of geographic, if you will, homogeneity of, of uh, Tunisia. I think the, uh, I'll, I'll just mention one factor, and Gilles knows a lot more about these things. Um, in Morocco, the fact that the royal family derived its legitimacy through its prophetic lineage forced it to become very accommodating of both Islam and Islamism, okay? Um, and after a couple of failed assassination attempts against King Hassan in the 1970s, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood was given far greater reign over the education system, 
which we didn't also talk about Jordan. I mean, in Jordan also, there was a turning point at that, uh, at that time uh, in terms of accommodating the Muslim Brotherhood to counter communist uh, forces within the country and giving the keys to the Ministry of Education to the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. Uh, you know, nothing the Muslim Brotherhood fought for uh, throughout the region more than control over the education system. Very briefly, um, the fact that there is turmoil in Algeria and Morocco is a French nightmare uh, because this will mean that uh, if the authoritarian states there fall down, not only we will, will we face tidal wave of immigration from people fleeing Algeria and Morocco to France, but also tidal waves of people going from sub-Saharan Africa through uh, Moroccan and uh, Algeria to France. And I'm sort of making it extreme, right? Because this is the way this is, this is which, the way it is feared now, after the Arab upheavals and after the Libyan uh, meltdown. Uh, the, um, I, one of the reasons why Algeria did not follow the same path, because you know, when Bouazizi set himself ablaze, there were many like phenomena in all of North Africa. Remember at the time, uh, before the oil prices fell down to $26 a barrel, sorry, uh, they, they reached a peak in, uh, uh, in 2010, it became extremely difficult to buy cooking gas. Uh, there were fires everywhere in Ukraine, in Australia. The price of wheat and grains, as they said in the good old days of the French Revolution, skyrocketed. And so for a number of people, suddenly there was this feeling of terrible poverty. Uh, that would translate into a revolt in, uh, and political dimension of the revolt in Tunisia. In Algeria, where the conditions were more or less the same, even though there was more money because of oil, but this oil money was not redistributed equally, uh, people, there was, you know, s movements that started, but they did not get a significant following, not only because uh, Sécurité Militaire was taking care of it, but because people still felt uh, the the you know the, the the weight of the of the civil war of the 1990s. Everybody in Algeria who's my age or even younger remembers what happened 20 years ago, and they did not want it back. Uh, things now may change, and uh, uh, Morocco has developed a very strong sort of. Um, north-south axis. Uh, if you talk to Moroccan elites now, they say we have nothing to do with the Middle East, with the Arabs. We have, what well, all we have to do is with Senegal, with uh, former uh, French Western Africa, and with, Euro uh, with Europe, with a sort of vertical dimension. Uh, if you want to go from Paris to most of uh, West African capitals, now you change plane in Casablanca. French banks then have been bought by Moroccan banks, and so on and so forth. And uh, they are trying to, to take their hands as much as they can from this part of the world and turning towards the Atlantic, towards America. So I don't know whether this will work because uh, there is enormous population increase and so on and so forth. But um, there is a de the development of a civil society significantly in Morocco today. And the problem with Tunisia, which we did not mention, is that for all the good uh, things that happen on the social, on the legal, on the political, on the democratic front, there are no jobs. And the fault line between the coastal era, and uh, you have a map uh, to that effect in the book, and the rest, the hinterland, is widening. And uh, when you're, and, and well, there is a good education system in Tunisia by comparison with the rest of the region, and well educated young Tunisians move. If they cannot move to France or to the West, they go to Morocco nowadays. 
not to Algeria, of course, and which is which is a major problem. So we, we're uh, we're on the watch out for that, and uh, uh, in Europe and particularly in France, uh, this is this is a question of, of extreme concern. Yeah. Right. Maybe take some more questions. Yeah. Happy to stay here as long as you want. Do you want a microphone? Very specific things, which is good. But if, if I can ask two very general questions, just about trends and looking, take, stepping back from the big picture. One, how do you think the U.S. and Europe handled the Arab Springs? Could they have what could they have done to make the outcomes better? And two, where do you see this region going now, in particular with relation to Daesh? Is it really defeated since they lost, since they have no territorial um, hold anymore? Do you expect these more huge attacks in Europe, like the Bataclan three years ago tonight? Um, or, or do you think, is it all one big unknown? I mean, what, what do you see as, as the trend for the future? Thanks. I think, Gilles, you should uh, talk about uh the uh, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe uh, jihadism 4.0, the fourth generation of jihadism. Uh, in, listen, any of us who've been observing the region, um, even when the world thought that Daesh would never be defeated, um, the question was: even if Daesh is militarily defeated, is it really defeated? And I think the answer to that is no. I mean, the, uh, what has made Daesh um, come into being, and what I worry about, what I've witnessed, is the sympathy um, toward Daesh, the support that Daesh had among youth in countries that are otherwise incredibly moderate and modern, like Jordan. Okay, that's what I worry about. So I think that there are the the trends that underscore the support for Daesh um, will 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 be there for a while. But I think you know, Gilles, uh, Gilles can can talk about that. How has the U.S. and Europe? Uh, yeah, there are many many things that they could have done differently. For one thing, not gone into Iraq in two thousand and three. I mean, um, seriously, the way that uh, Iraq was handled um, has given rise to uh, many openings, including the creation of Daesh. Daesh is not a product of the Arab Spring. Daesh is a direct product of the invasion of, uh, of Iraq. Gilles? It is, it is uh, a byproduct of the uh, invasion of Iraq. But it is also something that has to do with this sort of bottom-up jihad uh, process that was created out of the the European values and in you know in the mindset of uh, Abu Musab al Suri. So I agree with you that it's not over. They have lost their uh, capacity for operations. I mean, I'm not under police protection, so I can't judge for myself anymore uh, since the fall of Raqqa. Uh, but uh, when we talk to the guys in jail, the jihadists in jail, and uh, when we watch what they, with my students here what they what they say on the on the websites, and some of us uh, in the room are are doing conducting interviews in the in the banlieues and listening to what is being said in the, in a number of mosques today, sympathy for those groups is not really diminishing. Uh, the issue is that uh, the model for action is, it is now dysfunctional. People uh, would say, well, we probably sinned because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give us victory. He tested us and uh, so we have to, 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 to discover what we did wrong and do something uh, right again. For the time being, I haven't seen the, 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 so the first steps of the 4G jihad, uh, but you know, maybe I'm too old and now it's for the new generation to take over. With this, I guess that our friends here must be hungry or angry or... Just take a couple more questions here. Don't wait here. No, they are not. They are still hungry for knowledge. I'm sorry. I don't know how to work this. 
<clears throat> getting back to Saudi Arabia, um, in the New York Times today, there was an article, I don't know if anyone dares address this, <laughs> um, by, about the sermon in Mecca of the, of the head imam. Yes. And I wonder if it isn't very important what he said, what he didn't say, and what the outcome might be of that. I don't know if anyone dares mention it, you know, address that. So uh, this was in reference to, I mean, you know, so sermons that uh, take place during Friday prayer at mosques are always um, run by, well, if not written by, <laughs> they're at least approved by the central authorities in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they always end with prayers for the rulers and, and the royal family and so on and so forth. The sermon that took place, I'm not sure if it was last Friday or the Friday before, but very recently, uh, was unprecedented in that it um, uh, basically attempted to absolve MBS of any involvement in the Khajurji affair and spoke about Western conspiracies and fake news that is uh, meant to weaken Saudis and it is an attack on Islam. I mean, you know, that's the thing. The moment you say this is an attack on Islam, this is the infidel uh, Christian and the Jewish Zionist enemy uh, going after us, okay, and uh, uh, trying to humiliate Islam is how you get the people roused up. So the, it was a very powerful article by um, a UCLA um, Islamic scholar whose name um, I forget that uh, really, I mean, you know, spoke about that, but spoke about sort of a continuing trend in Saudi Arabia. Uh, MBS, I'm not afraid to say it, is an incredibly dangerous man. And I um, personally took that position years ago and never bought any of the things that he was trying to sell. Um, you know, talk about um, pulling wool over our eyes, but we deserved it with women driving, because for 30 years, what were we saying in Paris and in New York? Look at how backward the country is. Women cannot even drive. That's what we focused on, women driving. So he decided, you know, you want women to drive? Hell, robots can drive today. I let women drive, okay? But I won't touch the guardianship system. You know, I won't touch the other things that humiliate uh, women on a day-to-day -day basis. And if women think that they brought about this change, I'm gonna round them up. And they did. Khajurji was not the first Saudi to be rounded up from outside of the country. Um, you know, uh, Hatul, uh, you know, Jothain was rounded up in the United Arab Emirates. Her then husband was rounded up in Jordan. There are three Saudi princes who were rounded up from abroad uh, over the past few years. We haven't heard from them since. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing, but to go back to your point, um, there's nothing, it's new and it's unprecedented that a sermon would attempt to do this, but within the context of what has been happening in Saudi Arabia and the um, greater centralization of power of MBS, it's not surprising. It's also not surprising because another reform that MBS um, has been celebrated for around the world is that he has curbed the authority of the uh, the, the, the morality police. Yes, he has. But that should not be interpreted as marginalizing or, or, or fighting or diluting Wahhabism. He can't do that. It is so deeply ingrained, not only in Saudi society, but it's in, education, it's in its education system, in its legal system, and that dates back to the time of King Faisal. So it takes place in the 1960s that all of these things become entrenched in it. But it goes back even further with the founding of the state in 1932. The, the, the codependence between Wahhabism and um, the, the um, Saudi monarchy uh, dates back to 1744 when the pact was first uh, uh, drawn up between, between, between the two. So, um, you know, the, the religious authority and the House of Saud are very interdependent. So in that context, it's also 
uh, not very surprising that the clergy would be a tool of the state. I, I hear alarms going off. <laughs> Probably that means something. Um, Late for dinner. I, I think it means that it's time to buy the books that are in the lab. <laughs> And if you don't, you won't actually be allowed to leave the room. <laughs> but I think that would be a good idea, and so let's just do that. Thank you. Thank you.